away to lunch or from lunch. And at this point, I'd like to invite our own wonderful um, chapter leader, Head for Act for Canada, Valerie Laidley Price, who's going to come up and introduce our very special friend and guest, Rahil Raza. Come on up, Val. I have the great honor today of introducing a fellow Canadian, Raheel Raza, and what a Canadian she is. You know, in Canada, we're sort of known as being low-key, quiet, well, I guess I'm the exception, <laughs> modest, self-assuming, and self-effacing. This does not describe Raheel. She is a warrior. When she sees issues that need to be confronted, she makes a very big noise. She loves our country and is passionate about speaking out. Now, just for a little background, I hope you don't mind me telling what year you were born, Raheel. She was born in 1950 in Pakistan. She graduated from Karachi University with degrees in psychology and English. In 1989, she, her husband, and her two sons moved to Toronto. In 1995, she became a proud Canadian citizen. I wish they would all be like Raheel. Raheel is a devout Muslim. How does one describe Raheel Raza? She is so many things, but just to name a few. She is the president of a newly formed organization called Muslims, the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow. She is the author of a book called Their Jihad, Not My Jihad. She is an award-winning journalist. She is a documentary filmmaker. Whose Sharia is it anyway? Dealing with a Sharia debate in Ontario. A few years ago, we came quite close to having that passed. She is a great public speaker, as you will see. She is an advocate for human rights, gender equality, and dignity in diversity. She's accredited with the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva through the International Humanist and Ethical Union. She runs a forum for learning for youth to educate them about the dangers of radicalization and terrorism and continues to write and speak about the subject. She is a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for Service to Canada. And finally, she is the first Muslim woman, woman in Canada to lead mixed gender prayers. As I said, Raheel is loud and vocal and passionate about many issues. On Islamic extremism, she says, I have been sued for calling extremist extremist. And I am listed on the 10 world's most hated Muslims list. I'm number six. I hope to be number one. <laughs> Obviously, I'm doing something right. On debunking the term Islamophobia, she states that this has become a penalty card against dialogue, debate, and discussion in stifling free speech. On advocating female-led mixed gender prayers, she asserts that it is not about taking the job of an imam. It is about reminding the Muslim community that 50% of its adherents are women who are equal to man. On the, on the public banning of veils, she proclaims that when people come to Canada, we're not coming to the Islamic Republic of Canada. We are coming here because we want the separation of church and state. On immigration, she recently called on the Canadian government to suspend all immigration from terror-producing countries like Iran and Pakistan. She also spoke out loudly on the Park 51 Muslim Community Center at Ground Zero, opposing prayers of any kind in schools, stopping Sharia law in Ontario, and is always fighting passionately for the rights and protection of Muslim women around the world. Today, Raheel will speak on how political correctness, something Canada is famous for, has muzzled the conversation about radical Islam. My fellow Canadian, it's all yours.
Thank you so much. Uh, I believe there's a short film that we are showing before I begin to speak. Am I right? Okay. Almost every day, we are told that Islamist terrorism has nothing to do with Islam. Muslims are peaceful and tolerant people and have nothing whatsoever to do with terrorism. Al-Qaeda's cause is not Islam. ISIL is not Islamic. And we are told that Muslims reject the extremists. The overwhelming majority of Muslims reject that interpretation of Islam. It's very important for us to align ourselves with the 99.9% .9 of Muslims who are looking for the same thing we're looking for. But is it true that 99.9% .9 of Muslims don't support extremism? What would you say if scientific polls by major research organizations have repeatedly shown a very different picture? I'm Raheel Raza, I'm a Sunni Muslim, and for the past 20 years I've dedicated my life to speaking out against the rising threat of radical Islam. When there is a disease or a virus, it can't be treated unless you identify the problem. So we have to call it what it is, and it is violent, radical, extremist Islamism. This is not an easy topic to discuss, but in light of the fact that most of the terrorism in the world today involves Muslims in one way or another, and because it directly affects our lives and security, I think that we need to be able to have an open, honest, and fact-based conversation about that. Let's be honest. Islam has a problem today. There is a cancer of extremism within Islam today. This is not a conversation about Islam. It's a conversation about the growing threat of radical Islam and how it affects us all. And that conversation begins now. Our society has evolved to a point where we can have a civilized debate about almost anything. Anything except what may be the most important issue of our time, the rise of radical Islam. Liberals somehow feel worried that they're going to be called racist if they criticize people of the Muslim faith. The sphere of being called a racist has caused many people to act against their better judgment, and it may have even cost innocent lives. <laughs> At least 14 killed, another 17 wounded. It happened in San Bernardino, a city... In San Bernardino, California, two Muslim terrorists who had pledged allegiance to ISIS killed at least 14 people. Inside Baruch's house, police found a virtual bomb-making laboratory with smokeless powder and remote control cars. But a few weeks before the attack, some neighbors apparently noticed suspicious activity but didn't call the police. Why? That man that we interviewed said he never said anything because he didn't want to be seen as racially profiling. Did political correctness cost people their lives? It's hard to say for sure, but we do know that it's become harder and harder to speak about these things without being told we are racist. Freedom of speech, freedom to practice any religion you want without fear of violence. Mm -hmm. These are liberal principles that liberals <laughs> applaud for. But then when you say, in the Muslim world, this is what's lacking, then they get upset. It's, it's an ugly thing. Man, it's yeah. gross. It's racist. How about the more than a billion those, people those who are aren't Muslims fanatical, too. who don't punish well, women, who just want to go to the store? Okay, wait a second. 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 But I don't need celebrities defending me from talk show hosts. I need to be defended from the radicals in my own religion who want me dead. Radical Islamists who behead people, set people on fire, pour battery acid on women's faces, murder people in the name of my God. Radicals who seek to take over the world in the name of my religion. We need to establish the domination of Islam. We believe that the Sharia will be implemented worldwide. So let's get real and look at some numbers. Today there are around 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. In fact, Islam is the world's fastest growing religion, and according to Pew Research, it will surpass Christianity this century. Now, obviously, not all Muslims are radical. 
but a certain percentage are. Sam Harris helps break it down for Ben Affleck and for all of us. As you say, we have 1.5, 1.6 billion mm -hmm. Muslims. Now, Second biggest religion in the world, a quarter. Well, Ben, let me let me unpack this. Let me unpack this for you. Please do. Um, we have a, 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 just imagine some concentric circles here. You have at the center, you have jihadists. These are people who wake up in the morning wanting to kill apostates, wanting to to die trying. They believe in paradise. They Horrible they, they bad people in, that, in, yeah. in martyrdom. That's the first circle of radicals: violent jihadists like ISIS, Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, Hezbollah, Hamas, and various lone wolves. These are the jihadists who murder people in San Bernardino, Texas, Paris, London, Delhi, Jerusalem, Ottawa, Madrid, Nairobi, Boston, and of course New York. These are the horrible bad people, as Ben Affleck said. So how many violent jihadists are there? There are anywhere between 40,000 to 200,000 Muslims involved in fighting for ISIS across the world. That's just ISIS. And it doesn't include the hundreds of thousands of jihadis fighting for Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and other groups. But the thing about terrorism is that it only takes a handful of terrorists to do serious damage and even change the way a society operates. Explosives hidden in shoes and other improvised bombs are an active ongoing threat. And with the refugee crisis, the number of ISIS jihadis operating in the West is also set to increase. The huge numbers are a challenge to security, with many arriving refusing to identify themselves upon arrival in Europe. This is the ideal situation for ISIS to penetrate several countries in Europe. And according to reports, the mastermind of the Paris attacks snuck into Europe claiming to be a refugee. He boasted of being able to travel freely between Europe and Syria. And while radical Islamists are sneaking into Europe, twice as many British Muslims are fighting for ISIS than are fighting in the British Armed Forces. In the gruesome video showing James Foley's murder, many were shocked to hear his executioner speaking with a British accent. This is James Wright Foley. America is not immune to this danger. Today, federal prosecutors say a man trained in Syria returned to the United States to launch a terrorist attack here at home. According to U.S. Homeland Security, there have been over 122 U.S. terrorist cases involving homegrown violent jihadists since 9-11. Fortunately, many of them have been thwarted by law enforcement. That's the first circle murderous, violent jihadists in Europe, in America, and around the world. But what about the next circle outside of them? Outside of them, we have Islamists. These are, these are people who are just as convinced of martyrdom and paradise and, and wanting to, to foist their religion on the rest of humanity, but they want to work within the system. They're not going to blow themselves up on a bus. They want to change governments. They want to use democracy against itself. Islamists want many of the same things as the jihadists. It's just that their tactics differ. So instead of engaging in terror themselves, they use the political and cultural system to further their aims. Take Gaza, for example. In 2006, Palestinians voted Hamas into power. Hamas is a radical terrorist group that used democracy to gain legitimacy and political power. Also included in this circle are a large percentage of Egyptians who in 2012 elected the Muslim Brotherhood into power. Egypt has a new president this evening, Mohamed Morsi, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood was formed in Cairo in 1928. It's known as the progenitor of modern political Islam and has a stated goal of establishing a global caliphate or Islamic state run in accordance with Sharia law. Morsi wants to impose Islamic law, limit the rights of women. His party is not pro-American. Now, while the Muslim Brotherhood is primarily a political organization, it has spawned many terrorist groups around the world, including Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and others. Although distinct from the groups we just described, there is an organization here in North America called CARE, which the Department of Justice said is or was a member of the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood. CARE presents itself as a moderate civil rights group representing the interests of Muslims in America. Yet when you look a little closer, 
many disturbing things start to emerge. A controversial American Muslim group is facing new charges of ties to Islamic terrorism. The United Arab Emirates has just listed HAIR as a terrorist organization. ISIS and Al-Qaeda are also on that list. And in the United States, CARE was named as an unindicted co-conspirator in a major terror funding trial. Groups like CARE try to silence people like myself and others who dare to speak out about radical Islam. Case in point, a film that I was in featuring nine women who spoke out against barbaric treatment of women by radical Islamists got shut down. Why would CARE want to silence this film? That's what they do. They try to shut down debate by crying Islamophobia, even at Muslims like me. That's the second circle. Now this next circle is the largest of them all, and this is very disturbing. The Muslims in this circle are certainly not like ISIS, and they're not working to overthrow governments like the Muslim Brotherhood. But they do hold beliefs and practices that no doubt will seem radical to you and me. They hold views about human rights and about women, and about homosexuals, that are deeply troubling. Who are they? What are their beliefs? In 2013, Pew Research released a comprehensive study based on interviews with thousands of Muslims in 39 countries. It reported that in countries like Afghanistan, Egypt and Jordan, the vast majority of Muslims surveyed between 79 to 86 percent believe that those who leave the Muslim faith should be executed. Do you know anyone who has left their faith? Do you think they should be executed? Do you think that that's a radical belief? If we were to take the average from all the Muslims surveyed around the world, we end up with an average of 27 percent who believe that apostates should be executed. 27 percent of those surveyed, that equals 237 million people. Did you know that 39% of all Muslims in the country surveyed believe that honor killings can be a justifiable punishment for a woman who has had pre- or extramarital sex? Do you think that's a radical belief? That radical belief is held by over 345 million Muslims. These studies paint a picture of an Islamic world that is increasingly out of step with the modern world. When it comes to support for terrorism and jihad, these are the numbers for young Muslims aged 18 to 29 in Western countries. 42% of French Muslims, 35% of British Muslims, and 26% of American Muslims believe suicide bombings against non-Muslims can be justified. This is the next generation of Muslims speaking. A majority of Muslims surveyed, 53%, said they want Sharia or Islamic law to be the law of the land in Muslim-majority countries. Of those who said they want Sharia to be the law of the land, over 52% said they support whippings and cutting off of hands of thieves. This comes to about 281 million people. Do you think that's a radical belief? And 51% say they're in favor of stoning spouses if they're unfaithful, which equals 289 million people. Of course, not every Muslim believes in these things, but hundreds of millions do. The numbers are right here for all to see. It's time for an honest conversation about one of the most important issues of our time. By silencing the debate about radical Islamist beliefs, we abandon our own core beliefs of truth, free speech and tolerance, and we abandon human rights in favor of political correctness. Together, we have begun the conversation. Now it's time for you to have your say. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. That was not meant for you to lose your appetite over lunch. 
Um, I'd like to thank ACT for inviting me here to speak. As you've already heard, uh, you heard me say that I'm a Sunni Muslim. That's very boring. I'm going to add some more color to that. I am a Sunni Muslim. I am married to a Shia, and our children are Sushis. <laughs> you know, with a heavy film like that, we need some downtime for humor. So I've been speaking out against radicalization for the past 20 years, you know, the usual stuff about bombings, beheadings, and now burkinis. I speak out in favor of women's rights, not your typical women's lip kind of gal. You know that there are plenty of those on the left who haven't done anything to move the cause. I speak out about honor-based violence. You know, there are very few people today who will start off their introduction by claiming to be a Sunni Muslim, the very people who are causing death and destruction in the world today. And the question that I get asked the most, two days ago by Professor Richard Dawkins as I shared a dinner table with him at a secular conference in the United Kingdom, is why are you still a Muslim? So I follow the spiritual message of my faith, and I've left the harshness in the text to the followers of the seventh century as it does not apply to us anymore. Thank you. The fact that I express an unabashed love for Israel has labeled me a Zionist agent. I've just added, thank you. I've just added to my bio, unpaid Zionist agent, as I struggle to change the world as a pensioner. <laughs> if my Jewish friends are li listening, more power to them. <laughs> and for all this, I'm the proud recipient of a fatwa, death threats on three occasions, and an attempted lawsuit. So if you have a problem with me, you just have to take a ticket and stand at the back of the line. <laughs> Why this glowing introduction? Because my book, Their Jihad, Not My Jihad, written very soon after the July 7th bombings in London, UK, predicted what we are seeing today. And it's a very sad thing to be able to look back and say, I told you so, but that is unfortunately the case. Except there were two words that I didn't share in the book and I didn't realize they would strike so hard at the heart of North America, and that is political correctness and Islamophobia, both of which I'm going to speak about. So let me first add that I stand here not as an apologist, but as a reformist Muslim. As all of you clearly know the level of the problem we are faced with, but the West's inability to accept the numbers that you just saw in this documentary is one of the biggest challenges. This is a problem that has been in our face for over 30 years now. It's not a new problem. ISIS is not something unique that has emerged today, and ISIS by itself is not the heart of the problem. Whether they call themselves Taliban, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, or Al-Nusra, they are all manifestations of the same evil ideology. And it's because of this that Muslims in the West today are largely influenced by three major um, major strains of thought. It's either Khomeiniism for the Shias, it's Wahhabi Salafi ideology for the Sunnis, or it's the Muslim Brotherhood, which of course we know is the most dangerous. So how did we end up where we are today? The previous speaker gave you a wonderful idea of that. There are a lot of reasons for why we are where we are today, and I'm going to speak about a few issues that we have discovered in our journey towards fighting radicalization and terrorism. In Canada, we thrive on something called multiculturalism, and I know that it exists here as well, which I actually call monoculturalism. This is an umbrella under which there is so much trouble that it's taken years for people to wake up to what it is. The idea that is being presented under the umbrella of multiculturalism is that somehow all cultures are equal. 
They're not. And this is not about being good or bad. The fact a culture that does not respect his women is not the same as a culture that does. So this idea of multiculturalism has allowed a lot of water under the bridge. We also deal with the issue of white liberal guilt. You know, I was slammed for calling um, mayor, uh, the mayor of New York a victim of white liberal guilt when he wanted to agree to the building of the mosque at Ground Zero. But this is something you see in the entire Western world. I was on a trip to Sweden last month, and I was meeting with the Swedish parliament. I was invited from Canada to speak about honor-based violence which much to my horror, I learned the percentage of honor-based violence and rapes in Sweden were extremely high, but they have a code of silence. So the, um, the, the political parties don't want to talk about it. And in a meeting with one of the MPs, I said, you know, this is a beautiful country, you have great infrastructure, what is the problem? And she looked at me straight in the eye and she said, we don't like ourselves. We don't like ourselves. We feel we have too much, so we have to bend over backwards to appease others. And you know what was horrifying for me is to learn that they have this naive idea that they're going to bring in ISIS fighters and somehow rehabilitate them. This is just as disingenuous as those of our leaders who think that they're going to sit around a table and have this nice, warm, fuzzy talk with these extremists who are holding a gun to your head, and somehow they're going to rehabilitate them or change their mind. And our prime minister, in his wonderful naivety and good looks, just thought that sending blankets and warm clothes to ISIS would stop them from waging a war against the West. I mean, you know, there's a very fine line between being naive and being disingenuous and stupid. And we are bordering that line right now. We are facing a denial of the acceptance and articulation of the fact that the extremists are at war with us. Now, I don't say we are at war with them, because we didn't declare this war. They are at war with us. And it's not just me saying it. They have said it time and again. They hate the West. They're going to destroy us, all of us included. And in the meantime, while they have declared war on the West, the West is so busy appeasing them and thinking that if they appease them, perhaps they won't harm us. Let's be nice to them, and they won't hurt us. That's not how it works. One has to read the history and understand that appeasement and containment is not the solution. They will keep on attacking if this is the policy that is taken. And then, of course, you have the Islamophobia industry. And I call it an industry because on the backs of billions of petrodollars, it has been boxed packaged and marketed so effectively that each one of you, well, I wouldn't say the people in this room, you are an exception. But most people, most Americans and Canadians are terrified to use the word Islam or Muslims. And so in many ways, the extremists have been extremely successful because they have made Islamophobia the block that stops anyone from speaking out. And while this is happening, while they have stemmed free speech, while they have muzzled criticism, on a lower level, on a lower layer, this issue of unreasonable accommodation is continuously growing. And where do you see it manifest? You see it manifest in the niqab, in the burqa, in Sharia courts. And for your information, I've just come back a day ago from the United Kingdom, and much to my horror, I learned they have a hundred active Sharia councils in the United Kingdom. It was 83 last year, it is now 100, all done under the blessing of the government. So these are the issues that are filtering under the surface, and these are the dots that we have to connect. Radicalization is not all about killing people only. It's about the infiltration and what happens at a lower level. There is a denial and complete fiasco of the regressive left. And we know that. Politicians, academics, feminist groups, pop culture icons, Ben Affleck. I mean, these are all people who are not helping our cause. So while our opponents have been at it rigorously for over 30 years, and that is about the time that 
I left Pakistan and moved to the West. There is no organized movement of progressive, free-thinking, humanist, liberal, democracy-loving Muslims, and I happen to be one of them. So therefore, I'm not a moderate Muslim, because the, Mus the Muslim Brotherhood now calls itself moderate, and I would never be associated with that. So if one did need to label me, I would say I'm a humanist Muslim. You know, whenever a terrorist attack takes place, the world expects Muslims to speak out. But when we do, we are called stealth jihadists or those indulging in taqiyya. Seriously? Guys, is that as good as you can get? The point is that there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. You can't deport or incarcerate them, or millions in North America. So I think the only choice we have, or you have, is to work with those who are speaking out. You know, Dr. Tafik Hamid, who I think is a friend of uh, Act for America, lives here in Washington, brilliant, brilliant uh, writer and speaker, used to be um, a radical, has now converted. He said, and I quote, attacking all Muslims or disrespecting all of them without being able to distinguish between those who want to implement violent Sharia principles and those who want to understand and practice their religion in a peaceful way is a mistake that could push the world towards inexorably and to a violent zero-sum clash of civilizations. So while it's certainly fair to attack violent and discriminatory Sharia principles, it's also very important to recognize and support true liberal Muslims who are putting their own lives at risk in the fight to save the world from radical Islam. But my question would be to you, is it enough that only Muslims speak out? What about the rest of the people who don't speak out? What about the heads of state who are in bed with the Islamists? In my trip to the United Kingdom, I was horrified to learn that there is now a deal between the UK and Saudi Arabia that they are not going to criticize them at the United Nations. So, you know, this is also, we need to call out our leaders. We need to challenge them. They need to show responsibility. We've just heard the previous speaker talk about the financing, which is a huge problem. And I'm proud to tell you that the... Um, Progressive Muslim groups in Canada, including my organization, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, worked with the government to have them track, the, trace the financing that was coming into the mosques and the Muslim organizations. Once you track the money, 25% of your problem is solved right there, because you know when on the backs of petrodollars there are agendas. The signature of the Islamists is stamped on Sharia courts, and they have the blessings of their elected representatives. So very often, the Islamists are in the government or giving advice to our leaders, and this is how these, these Sharia courts start with a small movement. Again, Valerie had mentioned, we fought Sharia courts in Ontario. It took us one year, but the actual legal loophole in the law that allowed for arbitration was thrown out. So we were able to escape this. It's possible to do it here as well. So what is happening is that instead of identifying the Islamists, we are electing them. Their infiltration is complete in accordance with the Muslim Brotherhood mandate. That is what they said. Infiltrate and weaken them from inside. And we have allowed them to do that. So some of the responsibility rests on our shoulders. And I say this as a Muslim because I know that I remember that when we used to see the religious leadership, when we used to see the mullahs, we used to laugh at them never realizing how dangerous they could be. We should have spoken out 30 years ago, but we left our country and came to Canada thinking that none of this was going to follow us here. It's horrifying after 30 years to see that the very ideology we escaped has now followed us to North America. It is our duty to collectively light a fire under the feet of our political and religious leaders. And you know, I ha when I said this on my BBC Hard Talk interview, the interviewer looked at me and said, oh, you like to burn things. And, you know, either we light a fire today or we all burn tomorrow. 
So we have to light a fire under the feet of our political and religious leadership. For the religious leadership, it is the responsibility of the Muslim communities to do this work. So we have to plan and have a strategy just like the world did when it defeated fascism, Marxism, and communism. Now we have to deal with Islamism. But we can only deal with Islamism if our leaders can articulate the word Islamism and they don't stumble over it and they don't choke over it. They have to understand this is where the problem is. And it's a war of ideas. It was never a war of weapons. It is an ideology. It has to be challenged. We have to challenge challenge the OIC. You know, when people talk about ISIS and the caliphate, they don't realize OIC is the caliphate. They have power and control in the United Nations like you would not believe. Every time I go there, I feel like throwing up when I see how much influence they have in the United Nations. And there are countries who will support each other's lack of human rights only for popularity. So we at this level who are trying to fight this battle have to understand that we are up against major financing, against billions of petrodollars, against manpower, but we have to come together. We have no choice. This has to be a movement consisting of Muslims and non-Muslims. It doesn't matter if you don't like Islam or Muslims. Whatever personal angst you have, it can be parked in the parking lot until your questions can be answered. Right now, we are facing a global jihadist insurgency that gets stronger by the day. And I, I remember that, I would like you to remember that there's nothing that the jihadists and radicals would like more than pitting us against each other. It's their aha moment. This is what they want to do. They want to create a fissure where we hate each other. They love it when Mr. Trump makes these remarks because he's playing right into their hands. They want to see this, this separation because together we have to find a strategy to fight this evil. Now, although there are very few of us uh, in numbers who are actually speaking out, I'm optimistic in saying that it is making a difference. It's a, it's a very slow move, but we are continuously a thorn in the side of the radicals and laying a case out for reform, providing an alternate narrative. And I'll give you an example in our doctrine, in our declaration for the reform movement. We have very clearly said that we need separation of mosque and state for the reform to move ahead. We have said that notions of, like the doctrine of armed jihad, which was valid in the seventh century because there were no borders, there were no nation states, there was no UN, is no longer valid today. And a letter has been sent to the imams and leaders of all the Islamist organizations to say, do you agree or do you not agree? And if you don't agree, you are part of the problem. I mean, this is going to get us killed, but hey, at least we are sowing the seeds of change. So um, I don't want to uh, keep on monologuing. We are all here as Act for America and Canada, which is an excellent idea. Let us together act to safeguard the future of our children and grandchildren. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to open it up for questions. Hey, it was a long time since someone whistled at me. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody has a question, please uh, form a line and keep your questions short so that we can cover as much material as possible. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your voice of reason. I'm a little slow on the uptake. But what my question is, is how do we reply to our friends, fellow Americans, who state all Muslims who follow the Quran and Mohammed's example, which advocate world domination by the Islam religion. I have problems with this because I have many, and this sounds ridiculous, but I have many Muslim friends who are like you, the voice of reason. What do we say to them? Well, I would say to them that if 
the Quran and Muhammad wanted world domination, there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world today, we would have dominated. So that's not the case. There are different interpretations and understandings of the faith and the life of Muhammad. And there are millions of Muslims who are not looking for world domination, but just want to live their nine to five jobs. And again, it's a bit of naivety bordered with ignorance and reading wrong literature, which would make people think this, although if I was in their place, probably that would be my reaction, looking at what is happening in the world. So, you know, let's not judge Muslims through the lens of ISIS and the crisis that is happening today, which is very political in nature. So there are two strains of, well, there are many strains in Islam, but what we are faced today with is I follow the spiritual message of the faith, which has nothing to do with politics. And political Islam is the problem, and that is what we are trying to bring down. Thank you. Thank you. Or refer them to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. We use a lot of your films at our meeting. Thank you, Clarion Project, Ryan, we appreciate you so much. My question is, uh, the Declaration of Reform. I know you've sent that out, I've read it. Everybody should print it off your website and ask them, how many have you gotten back that said, yes, I agree or I disagree? Are they responding? I have two imams in my area. I took it to them. I asked them to sign it. They told me to get out. Yes, you're absolutely right. We actually haven't uh, formulated the numbers of the responses yet. I guess Zuti Jasir, who many of you know, <clears throat> is the one who has spearheaded this uh, Muslim reform movement and we, we are all part of it. We decided to do this as a global movement and across from Europe, uh, the United Kingdom, Canada and America. We haven't be, had a chance to sit down. We are sitting together next month to look at the results and I will let you know. I doubt too many of the Imams will sign it, but at the same time there may be surprises so we will have to let you know. Yes. Hi, I'm Dave Bailey, chapter leader for Delaware, and it was a pleasure to be able to shake your hand this morning because I quite often broadcast your material in uh, the newsletter I send out called Islam Update. So thank you know, you for under speaking. one aspect of Sharia law, your shaking hands would with, with me would make me put me out of the faith. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Means I drank too much. Which is coffee. why we don't like Sharia law. Um, now you've come out very strong in saying that women are equal to men. And, and coming out against honor killings. There's one verse with the Quran. I just want your feedback. The verse of retaliation. It says, retaliation is prescribed for you in the way of the slain. The free man for the free man, the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. Meaning, if a person kills another man's wife, then justice is for that man to come back and kill the murderer's wife. Now, there's a couple points on that. It can be explained away by saying, oh, they worked that out with blood money. Well, maybe that happens, but it doesn't have to happen. But the fundamental point is that women, like slaves, are property. Now, this is just right out of the Quran. It's not like under special circumstances. It's clearly policy. So my question to you is, how do you, as a liberated Muslim woman, reconcile yourself to this verse of the Quran? And if you simply reject it, What's your basis for rejecting it? Because if you just sort of arbitrarily say, I reject it without having a good reason that you can explain to people, that's really not going to be very convincing. So I would like to hear how you reconcile to this. Thank you for your Thank question. You. Now, you will appreciate that there are many different interpretations of the Quran, and that's not an apologist stance. The question is that there are, and it is, you know, it is possible to interpret and understand it in different ways. As a believing woman, I believe that God in his infinite mercy and justice would never allocate women and men in different statuses or allow something like this. Perhaps if we take the, the, the stance that even if it does exist, like the Old Testament, which had many violent parts to it, but that were left behind and are not practiced anymore, we need to learn from 
from our fellow religionists, from our people in Judaism and Christianity and have dialogue with them and understand how they moved ahead in the reform by putting aside those parts of the text that ask for violence. And I think that that is possible. I do read the Quran regularly, the parts that are difficult. I say this was for the seventh century. Actually, in our reform movement, that is what we say, that we can't rewrite it. It exists. The different understandings exist. But we look upon the creator as having created us equal. And we look upon the more positive aspects of it and keep the violence in the seventh century. This is why we have a problem with the caliphate that wants to live by the seventh century. They want to still have sex slaves. They want to have slavery. Perhaps these things existed or didn't. This is something I don't know. It has not been fully documented. But we can put aside those passages and look at the major portion of the Quran, which is about mercy and compassion and caring for each other. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Natasha Blong. I'm a student from Minnesota. Um, and I have a wonderful Muslim coworker who um, immigrated from Saudi Arabia. And he was telling me and my coworkers about um, the reason why he wanted to be in America and why he didn't want his kids to um, go to school there. And when I asked him about it, he said it was because the schools there teach all the students that they need to die, that all Muslims need to die killing, you know, infidels. And so my question is, like you said, if the UN won't criticize countries like Saudi Arabia, how are we going to stop the future generation from um, being radicalized in that same way? Thank you. That's an excellent question, and it can only come from a young, bright person. Um, I, so. The hate that is taught at the level of schools in the curriculum is a huge problem. And as I had mentioned before, the work of the reform is, happens in two ways. It has to come from within the Muslim communities, and this is where we have to put our effort, and there is an effort being made to check the curriculums in different countries. And of course, then the larger non-Muslim community for the support. Now, this issue with Saudi Arabia is not new. It has been going on for 10 years, and I remember there was a time when the US government pressured them and said, you need to get rid of all this hate in your curriculum. That's not the only kind. They have hate against Jews and Christians. I mean, their curriculum is awful. So for, they said that, oh, we have complied. And then when another check was done, it was found that, no, they have not complied. But it's not only that they have this, these curriculums there. What is happening now and is very dangerous, that they are exporting this hateful curriculum to Islamic schools in the West. And so, again, I keep giving the example of Canada because, you know, we are the glowing country in the world. We were able to pinpoint an Islamic school that was teaching a curriculum of hate towards Jews and Christians, and it was closed down. So what we need to do is be vigilant. We may not be able to influence the curriculums in India and Pakistan as much as we would like although we are working on it. But we need to keep an eye on the curriculums that are being taught in mosques and Islamic schools in North America. We will not allow hate in these institutions. And if it is happening, they need to be taken, you know, they need to be sorted out. So that is where we come into play. As Muslims, we can get into these institutions. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a, you've answered quite a few of the questions already, but I have a bit of a quandary since it seems to be the same scriptural sources that uh, inform both religious Islam or spiritual Islam, as you say, and political Islam. So I, I have a little bit of a uh, doubt to, to the possibility of reform, but uh, I would like to ask what can we do as non-Muslims to do our best to try to create a uh, climate for actual reform of that faith, some concrete ideas that a, just a normal uh, individual could possibly do to interact with Muslims in a way that could possibly lead them to reform. Thank you for that Thank question. You. 
Um, I will give you hope in uh, the form of organizations like the Quilliam Foundation in the United Kingdom, which is the only think tank that is a Muslim think tank that's fighting against terrorism that is working both on a theological and a social level. There's a lot of work being done on the theological level that you don't hear about because these are people who are afraid for their lives. For example, there is a reform interpretation of the Quran that is being written. Dr. Tawfiq Hamid has also interpreted the Quran by taking out all the parts that would lead to politicization, but it's only in Arabic. What you as non-Muslims can do is support those voices and those people who are working towards the reform, to give us the support in the mainstream, you know, uh, because we can't do this alone. It's very clear. We can't possibly do this alone. We need to be able to sit together and have the difficult conversations. As I said, this is uh, something that is ongoing. It's not going to happen overnight, maybe not even in my lifetime. Time. But I hope that my children and grandchildren will reap the fruits of the work that we put in today. The seeds have been sown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for being here. I'm very happy that, that you came. And um, I had a question because uh, both you and Stephen before you mentioned that we're at war. And Stephen got into the, the, the great details of uh, the tactics, how methodical they are about this. And everybody in this room already gets the fact um, of, you know, like preaching to the choir. And in our spheres back home, we have uh, spheres. So we need to start being methodical and patient and long-term planning. For instance, what occurs to me is like these 192 cities that Stephen mentioned that are being targeted as I'm sure they are not swing states. Because if they were in swing states, then those states would go uh, red in this election. So. Uh, one strategy could be like uh, states like New York, where I'm from, to, to try to whittle away at Hillary's, the fringes, the people that are on the fringes, that are undecided, and table and do tablings at strategically targeted places and areas. We're not planning that. We're still kind of, you know, we all get the, 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 the tactics and the Islamophobia and all those things. So. It's just a statement, I guess. I don't know if Thank you can you. address Thank it. You. Thank it's you. It's a very good statement, and what you said, I think, yes, you definitely need to be planning. We need to have Muslims and non-Muslims, those who care for the future and security and safety of our homelands. We need to sit together, and we need to be able to talk. And at a very grassroots level, because trust me, at a strategic level, there's a lot of work being done, and they're aware. We all know the problem, but we need to sit and talk about solutions, and sooner rather than later. Thank you. Hello, I'm a fellow Canadian. Um, as I see it, part of the problem with Islamism is that oh, but, uh, of distinguishing between Islamism and Islam is that so much of Islamism is based in the sacred text of Islam, the Quran, the Hadiths, and the Sirah or life of Muhammad. And when Muhammad established the mosque in Mecca, it wasn't just a place of worship. It was also a court of law, they had weapons, it was military headquarters, and all of this. And some of his actions, many of his actions, such as overseeing the beheading of the Jews, um, the Kariza tribe, were not merciful. So I very much applaud what you're doing, but I think, and I admire it, all the work, the, the film, and your um, outreach and speaking, but a person could make a case that based on adherence to the theology of Islam, you aren't really a Muslim, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. You, you, you have to leave so much of it behind, the question becomes, well, so what is Islam? Is it anything we want it to be? Or is, is there actually some ideology? Thank you so much for that question. It's interesting that you uh, bring this up because at the secularism conference I was in UK two days ago, uh, we were talking about exactly the you know, separation of church and state. So I'm not sure where you got your information from, but information comes from many different levels. And the information and knowledge I have is very different from the information and knowledge that you have, with due respect. 
so when uh, Muhammad came back to Mecca, it was in fact the time when he declared an, uh, an amnesty and he stood at the gates of Mecca and said that he was not going to punish anyone for having persecuted them and there was no revenge taken. So the idea that, and he left the constitution and the state back in Medina. So we actually say that there is a possibility of separation of mosque and state in that sense. I know that there are a lot of biographies that have been written about Muhammad and there's many different interpretations of, of the Quran. My recommendation is to read the biography that has been written by non-Muslims. Um, Leslie Hazelton, for example, or Deepak Chopra, which is much more objective than those written by Muslims and you'll maybe get a different perspective. Having said all of this, I come back to what I had said in the main text. The, the invoking the Quran or the Prophet or the Hadith today in the 21st century does not help us bring about the reform. At Muslims Facing Tomorrow and in our reform, we do not give pre uh, precedence to the Hadith. Much of the violence that you see in the Muslim world today comes from the Hadith, secondary commentary, and Sharia laws, all of which were man-made and put together about 200 years after the death of Muhammad. So that is where the problem lies, and for us that is the crux of the problem. And there's a lot of work, there's a lot of academic work, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of studying going into that, and that will resolve itself. It will resolve itself through Muslim uh, research and through their work. But in the meantime, in order to fight the jihadist ideology, we have to partner with organizations and people who are doing the work. And one of them is the organization that made this documentary by the numbers called The Clarion Project, which says challenging extremism, creating dialogue, promoting dialogue. And it's the only Western think tank that actually gives voice to liberal progressive democratic Muslims, Sufi Muslims, mystic Muslims, but also talks about the problem. And I think essentially that needs to be the role model for everyone. So I would invite all of you to go to that website and see how they expose the problem of radical Islam, no political correctness, everything that is happening every single day, but at the same time, they give a balanced voice to those who are working for change. All right, Thank we've you. got a final question. I want to follow up on the question from the gentleman from Delaware, and in your response to that, you, you said that a lot of Christians basically don't follow the Old Testament, or that a lot of that doesn't apply, and that's not true. The whole Bible is the Word of God. I'm sorry? The whole Bible is the Word of God. Now, the, the Old Testament, I'm, I'm getting to it, the Old Testament has a lot of stuff under the Mosaic and the Old Testament law. And that was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. So the righteousness of that, we don't have to follow the law. We just have to put our faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Okay. I, you must have misunderstood so, so, me. So I was that, referring to the so Old Testament. So it's not that the Old Testament isn't authoritative. It is. The okay. whole Bible is authoritative if understood properly. The so the question is, in the Quran, it says, men are in charge of women, dot, dot, dot. But those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them, if they persist, forsake them in bed, and finally strike them. So you never answer the question of how you get away with avoiding certain parts of the Quran that are inconvenient while still calling yourself a, a Muslim. What's your truth source? Okay, so um, those of you who are speakers of Arabic will appreciate that in Arabic, Every word can have more than one meaning. And there are many different in translations and interpretations of the Quran. And the first one that was done by a woman about three years ago called the Sublime Quran, an American woman called Dr. Lale Bakhtiar translated it. And she translated that very differently. She translated that verse as saying not about beating, but as moving away. And I'm willing to accept that because I am a believer. I'm a believer in my faith. I'm a believer in my holy book. It is considered to me to be the word of God, as you said, 
for you as a Christian, that is the word of God. Now, we can look at some of those uh, uh, readings and translations and say, as I said before, this was for the seventh century. It doesn't have to be implemented today. That it can evolve with time, and that is perfectly acceptable. It is acceptable in all scriptures, and that is where the reform comes, when you look at it and say it was for a certain time and place. The message of the Quran came over a period of 23 years. It exists. I can't fight with the word of God, but I can look at it and say, okay, I can park this in the parking lot and I can move ahead to the more compassionate parts of it, which there are many, and that works for me. Thank you. I don't know how to do this. Um, my immediate question was, why are you a Muslim if you, why are you still a Muslim if you don't want to accept the Quran as it is, given that there's the law of abrogation? Thank you very much. Um, for the nth time, I will answer that question by saying that I look at the spiritual parts of the Quran, I follow the spiritual Sufi version of Islam, there are many different ways to practice the faith, there are 72 denominations in Islam, one can practice it in different ways and the extremists practice it in a very violent way, I practice it in a spiritual way and I find great salvation and blessing in the way that I practice my faith. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rada. Stay here with me. Stay next to me. This is one amazing lady. And what I want to point out here, and I'll wait until the applause is over, she deserves an applause. Thank you. And what is so special about this conference and Act for America is we work so hard to give voice to people like Rahil and Tawfiq Hamid that she referred to, who was also a keynote speaker at our national conference in the past. Because it is our duty to come together as Americans, as humanitarians, as Westerners. You know, we, we, we say, come, let's reason together. And this is what makes our country exceptional, our Western nations exceptional, whether it's Canada or America. That we can come with people who come from different backgrounds and different ideas and stand shoulder to shoulder next to each other and even debate hot topics that we may not see eye to eye on, on every single sentence and every single word. But at least we come together and we respect each other and how we ended up where we are in our point of views. So it is such an honor for me personally to have someone like Reza Rahil, Rahil Reza, sorry, standing next to me here today. Because for both of us who are immigrant from societies that are very different than America, we are proud to be in societies that value us equally as men. We are proud to be a part of a society that gives us a voice while our own country does not give us a voice. We are proud to be in a society where we can stand holding each other arm in arm and debating issues and facing tough questions, yet be able to stand our ground and say, this is my opinion, and I have the right to this opinion, but I am so secure in what I believe, I'm willing to debate it with you because I came to this opinion because of my life experience. And what sets Act for America apart from many other organizations who engage in shouting and name calling, we don't do that. We respect each other and we respect the fact that in our country there are many people that flock here from all over the world and they all came here seeking refuge, whether in Canada or in America, we came here seeking a better life. Because if our countries were so hot, trust me, neither Rahil nor I will be standing here, right? <laughs> 
We are here because we believe in Western exceptionalism and our democracy. So throughout this conference, as you walk around and you meet people and you engage with people, I want you to realize how fortunate we are to be able to gather together as citizens who appreciate our democracy, our freedom, our equality, and our ability to practice whatever faith we choose as long as we respect the right of others to practice their faith and not put them down and realize that the laws and the constitutions of our countries are above all laws because we are all created equal in the eyes of God. These are the type of reformists we need to empower and engage and give voice to. And for CARE and any other Islamic front terrorist organizations who accuse us of Islamophobia or accuse us of being a hate group, they are the hate group. They are the ones who are trying to sabotage our societies by silencing people like Reza. Thank you, Reza, for being with us. We're so glad. Just uh, on, that, on that note, I want to just um, let you know something very quickly. This is trivia, that when it was published that I would be speaking at this conference, I started getting hate mail. So, yes, so, you know, it, it, it ranged from what the beep are you doing at this conference, and then Muslims writing in to say, why are you associated with a, a group of people who hate Islam and Muslims? And I never respond to these things because, you know, hey, I gave up being popular a long time ago. Oh, but the point, is, the point is, I'm so delighted to see all of you, to meet all of you. I have so many friends here. And what you said, we have to have the hard conversations. Absolutely. So I have a very good response now for those people who said, you know, well, what are you doing there? I'm going to go back and tell them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. By the way, I want you to know that CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, is bombarding members of Congress as we speak, asking them not to show up and speak at our conference tomorrow, which they did last year anyway, and every single one showed up. Uh, so CARE is so threatened by us, because when you speak the truth, when you stand on the truth, and when you can prove that you are talking about the love of country, the respect of others, and wanting to protect our country, they cannot fight that. All they can say is Islamophobia. All they can call us is hate groups. How can we be a hate group when we have a, a keynote speaker who's a Muslim who stands before you here and say, I'm a Sunni Muslim and I'm proud of it. And I'm married to a Shia and our kids are sushis. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we speak, CARE is bombarding members of Congress not to show up tomorrow. They send another email today. They already attempted that last week as well by calling us a hate group, etc., etc. And that's why we had Arabic TV here interviewing this morning and, and, and taking pictures. So, I want to make sure as you walk around, if you are approached by the media, any media, that you would make it a point to remind them as to why we are here, because we love our country, because we love our fellow humans, because we respect people who want to come to this nation to pray to whatever God they want to pray, as long as they respect the Constitution and as long as they respect our freedoms. We respect their spirituality as much as they respect us. Thank you. Gary is going to give questions. Thank you very much. Okay, we appreciate debate here and, and being in the military. We know we don't always agree with our, our brothers and sisters in the military, but we're all on the same team, so we need to remember that. The enemy is not in here. The enemy is out there that wants to behead and kill and silence. So um, I just wanted to quote John Adams. I must study politics and war that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. That's why we're here. So just stay flexible. Remember, we're all on the same team, even though we have differing opinions, and we might support different people who are running for office, but we are all on the same team to defeat, to, to defeat the enemy. So right now we're going to dismiss for lunch, and I want to let you know that uh, it will be in the ambassador ballroom. And the food is in the back, so if you would, take your plate, get your food, and then go have a seat, and then we will begin the program at 1230. And get to know your neighbors, too, because they're all in the fight with us. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Oh, and the CDs of the morning session are available if you'd like to purchase them. Thank you.
make it. So as you heard, a break now in this National Security Conference hosted by ACT for America. We will continue with live coverage starting at 2 p.m. Eastern. There will be discussion on religious persecution. A little bit later, former Congressman Pete Hoekstra, former Intelligence Committee Chair. And the final discussion will be on the vetting of refugees. Again, live coverage starting at 2 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN 3. Well, President Obama made a speech in Laos this morning shortly after leaving the G20 summit in China. And during the president's remarks, he talked about trade preferences and he announced $90 million over the next three years to remove unexploded bombs left over.